Good morning. As Father Miguel might have mentioned, my name is Deacon Joshua Fons, and I'm new here. I, uh, yeah, so I actually was just ordained one week ago. So it's great. To- and I get the privilege of getting to serve this next year here at St. Pat's. So it's a great blessing. And uh, a message from Father Matthias. He says that you should invite me over for dinner. (laughs) Those those are his words, not mine. A little bit of my own story. I grew up down in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I went to Father Gabriel Shard High School. I grew up going to Christ the King Parish. And I entered college seminary right after I graduated high school. I spent four years there. And then, actually, I left. Uh, I discerned out. I didn't think I was going to be a priest. And I spent a few years working with a group called FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, as a full-time missionary. And then at the end of that time, uh, was when the Lord called me back to seminary around three years ago. And now here I am, (laughs) ordained a deacon. And uh, after spending so much time, 12 years pretty much, preparing, discerning, now that I'm here, there's a little bit of a sense of, well, now what? (laughs) I've never done this before. Maybe you find yourself in a similar spot. Maybe you just got married or had your first kid. Now what? I've never done this before. Or maybe you're graduating from high school or college. Well, now what? I've never done this before. Or maybe it's your kids that are graduating, and now you have an empty nest for the first time. Well, now what? I've never done this before. Or maybe you retired Maybe you're suffering from the loss of a loved one. Never done this before. Now what? I think this can help put into context perhaps a little bit of what the apostles were feeling today on the ascension. Because remember, the apostles, these were just average guys. They worked trade jobs, some fishermen, yet a tax collector, until they met this man who changed everything. This man who said to them, come follow me. And they left everything and they followed him. And they saw him preach. They saw him work miracles. They saw him beginning to fulfill these prophecies that they'd heard about since they were little kids. And they're starting to wonder, could this be the one we've been waiting for? Could this be the Messiah? And then there was that night in Jerusalem, that night where he called them his friends the night where he washed their feet, that night he took bread and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body. And that night that he was betrayed, betrayed by one of their own, and they all fled and hid and ran. But then Jesus came back. The cross could not defeat him. The grave could not hold him. And it looked like everything was going to be right again. Like he would come and he would restore the kingdom. Like nothing could stop this man that they had come to believe was the son of God. But then they're standing on this hill in Galilee and uh, he says some last words and up he goes. Now what? Never done this before. Moments like this, these now what moments that we face in our lives, yes, can be full of uncertainty, full of difficulty, but they also can be tremendous moments of grace. In these moments, we're often faced with two choices. We can go back to what we've always done, to what's safe, what's familiar, what's comfortable, or we can take a step in faith. Not because we know what lies ahead of us, but because we know who leads us. These moments are of tremendous importance. They matter to our Heavenly Father who sees us, who sees us in these moments and is with us. And they matter for the sake of our own souls and the souls of so many who will be impacted by our choices in these critical moments. 
A long time ago in France, there was a young girl named Joan. She was just a simple farm girl. And France at that time was in the midst of the Hundred Years' War with England, torn apart by division and by war. And Joan started having these profound experiences in prayer where angels and saints were appearing to her. And eventually they told her that she was going to be the one who would lead the armies of France into battle so that France would win its freedom. And she was faced with a choice, like, <laughs> who am I? What? She could just... She could choose to either stay in her village, stay what was safe with all she ever knew, or she could trust in the Lord whom she loved. A hundred years or so, hundred or so years later in France, there was a young Spanish nobleman named Francis studying at the University of Paris, planning on living a comfortable life as a university professor, till his slightly odd roommate named Ignatius invited him to join this group of men who wanted to put their whole lives in the service of Christ and his church. And he faced a choice. Do I stick to my plan? Or do I trust in the king of kings? In the 19th century in England, there was a young Anglican minister named John Henry, who in his mid-30s, he was on a boat back from Sicily, and he was dangerously ill with a fever. But he also internally, he he was struggling with his faith struggling with how he saw the world and going through a time of immense darkness. But in the midst of this darkness, he penned a poem, a prayer to God. And I think it captures the essence of what trust looks like in moments like this. The poem's name is Lead Kindly Light, and it goes like this. Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark, and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. We follow Christ one step at a time. One day at a time. We seldom get the whole plan or the whole picture. Sometimes we just get the next step. On that day of the ascension, Christ left his apostles and he left us with pretty clear instructions for the next step. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded to you. Go, make disciples. Some pretty clear instructions. But sometimes we know that instructions on their own don't always cut it. I remember one time my mom left my dad some instructions when she was going to be out for the evening and my dad had to prepare dinner for us kids. Her instructions were in the form of a lesser known poem that simply went like this. Chicken in pot, heat till hot. (laughs) We ate pizza that night. (laughs) But thankfully, Jesus didn't just leave us instructions. He left us power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Jesus didn't just, as he ascended into heaven, say, good luck out there. He ascended into heaven so that he could send down his spirit. He not only gave us what we're supposed to do, but he gave us the strength and the power of the Spirit to do it. That he is faithful to his promise, that I will be with you always. Saint Joan of Arc ended up doing what all the generals in France couldn't do. In the power of God, she defeated the English and she freed France. Saint Francis Xavier ended up bringing the gospel all the way to India and Japan. Saint John Henry Newman ended up becoming a Catholic priest and bishop and a brilliant writer and defender of the faith. And each of these men and women, they walked in the power of the Holy Spirit that Christ had promised. They each rooted their lives deeply in the Eucharist, drawing near to Christ as he draws near to us. What could my life look like? What could our lives look like if we invited Christ into these moments of confusion difficulty, change, if we allowed him to light our path, 
when everything seems dark, if we beg to God for a greater outpouring of his Holy Spirit to be able to take that next step in faith, wherever Christ is leading us, I guess we won't know what it could look like until we try, until we trust. And so as we approach Pentecost, we should also imitate the apostles as they prepared for Pentecost, where they devoted themselves intensely to prayer because they knew they needed it. They had the instructions, but they knew they needed the power. And so we pray, praying for more of the Spirit. And I challenge you to pray each day intentionally this week, especially if you're going through a time of one of those now what moments, a time of uncertainty or difficulty where you're not sure on what the next step is. Pray, turn to the Lord, ask him to lead you, ask him to guide you by his light. Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me.